All right, so we are back looking to see who's running the show in, uh, for the next four years, <laughs> right? Um, the results are coming in. It is 7.40 p.m., so not a whole lot's coming in, but um, Trump's ahead now, so we'll see what happens. Okay, so we were looking at this particular um, example, um, and this is the answer, and I want to see how we come about it, okay? So I'm going to go through this particular Excel sheet that I've developed and, and uh, uh, go through some of the math, and I think you'll find this is pretty straightforward. So the first thing that we're looking at are some uh, uh, shears, okay? Now right off the bat, of course, I'm noticing a, a tad of a typo because that's supposed to be X in inches, but I think you could probably figure that out, that, you know, if this is 14, that's 168, 14 times 12. Okay, so what we're looking at is the very beginning of the beam and looking out. So if you want, you can think of it like this, you know, here's the beam, there's the support, so this is x equals 0, this is, you know, x equals 10, or what have you. All right. Sound good? So away from the support, the shears are going to decrease. Sound good? Now right now I'm focused on the region that starts at the abutment and extends outward and that's where I'm focusing my shear design. I could very similarly look at a pier and do the same thing. The process is exactly the same. I'm just trying to focus on a given region. Okay, so here's my DC1s, DC2s, DWs, my live loads and then I factor them according to strength one. All right, sound good? Now, what I'm doing in this column is I need a value for design. So I, I would propose, like if I look at this particular point, what shear do I care about, the 387 or the 107? The 387. And the way I'm doing that is I'm just taking the maximum of these two values. Now, if I'm looking right here, do I care about the 89 or the 119? I care about the 119. So really what I'm doing is taking the maximum of the absolute values. Make sense? So these are my columns of shears that I would use for design purposes. Sound good? Pretty basic. Okay. Now, I want to show you something right here. This is that, remember that forecasting formula I showed you all that would do all the linear interpolation? I put this here just to show you, so, um, you know, for instance, if I put in x equals 200, you know, it recognizes that I need to interpolate between here and here, because this is x equals 168 and this is x equals 336, so it's interpolating between the two and it's coming up with 289. Sound good? So that's that interpolation. Okay. So far, so good. That's simple, right? Now, let's go into this. Okay. There's a lot going on here, so I'm going to take my time with it. Okay? <clears throat> now, the first thing I want to look at is this table right here. I've got girder data. Okay? So I've got the compression flange, which is what? 16 by 1. I've got the web depth, which is 69 by uh, a half, and the yield stress is uh, 50 KSI. And then I've got 18 by 0.875. Now, technically, right here, if you look, there is a flange transition because the flange gets thicker later on in the span, but it really doesn't matter for what we're doing. All right. Sound good? Anybody have any questions? All right. We're, well, uh, what's happening with this bridge is that the moment demand is getting larger in the middle, so they made the flange thicker, essentially. It doesn't really matter for what we're doing. Ultimately, we really only care about the web. Sound good? Now, notice how I've got a bunch of rows that all say the same thing. Okay? Now, the reason for that is this. You know, I'm, each of these rows essentially represents a panel. So the first row, we're talking about this panel. And the second row, we're talking about this one and this one. Sound good? All right. So ultimately, I'm going to need to design three panels for this shape. Okay? Now, I have four lines. I don't need anything here, but you'll, you'll see why I've got that here in a second. All right. Sound good? Everybody good? Okay. All right. Now, 
All right, so everybody cool with, with this data? All right. Now, I want to look at a couple notes. So the first cross frame is located 24 feet from the support. The next cross frame, 48 feet from the support. So that's 288 inches and 576 inches. All right, so for you using the Excel sheet. Also, if you're interested, the solution's in here, but I want to iterate and play around with it a little bit and see what's, uh, what's going on. This note is why we don't need that last row of the, the Excel sheet for design. The values are necessary because we're going to need that for the stiffeners. Okay, sound good? Now, we already determined that we need stiffeners in this region. Okay, we need stiffeners. So, I'm going to have to put a stiffener somewhere right here, my first stiffener. So, I've got to place a stiffener somewhere from x equals 0 to x equals 103.5. How did I come up with 103.5? Well, for that first panel, I have to have a max spacing of 1.5 times the depth. Sound good? Everything else is three times the depth. So my panel's got to be somewhere between 0 and 103.5. Let's just guess 50. Doesn't, doesn't really matter. Let's just guess 50. All right. So let's just guess 50. All right. So based on that guess, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to compute C, that shear buckling ratio. Okay. Now, how do I compute that? It's this nice, pretty little image right here. Okay, so the first thing I compute is K, which is 5 plus 5 over D naught over D squared. D naught is what I just guessed, that 50, because that's where that panel is. Okay, all right, so there's that. Limit 1 and limit 2, what's limit 1 and limit 2? That's this and this, the 1.12 square root of EK over FY and 1.4 square root of EK over FY, all right? Excuse me. D over TW, that's the web slenderness. So D over TW calculated over there. Region, okay? Let me highlight this. This region is a big if-then statement, okay? Now, the way this works in Excel is, you know, if a value is less than or equal to another one, it's plastic. If not, then you just sort of keep going from there, all right? So here's the notation. It's pretty basic, pretty straightforward, you know, if this value is less than or equal to this, it's plastic. If the value is greater than this and less than or equal to that, it's inelastic or it's elastic, or plastic, inelastic, elastic. So region one, region two, region three. Sound good? Now, if we are in region one, then C is one, right? If we're in region two, how do we compute it? Well, it's this nice, pretty little formula right there, and region three, there's your pretty little formula. The last thing we need to do is make a determination which C matters, and since we're in the elastic range, that's the one that matters. Sound good? So, here's the whole point, okay? If I change this to, let's say, 60, it updates everything else. Sound good? Everybody okay with that? Okay, now, Let's look at the capacity. Okay. Now, for this first panel, we're not allowed to use tension field action. So all we can use is the, the straight capacity. In other words, this times that. That's it for that first panel. We can't develop those tension fields because it's an end panel. Okay. So what's our capacity? The plastic capacity times that. So 1,000.5 times this comes out to about 555, right? So that's the capacity. That's how much it can hold up. This is the capacity, or this is the, the shear that is on that panel, right? The maximum shear on that panel, which is this. We're starting at x equals 0, so it's the 387.75. Sound good? All right. So is this an adequate design? 
Well, yeah, I mean, it can hold up 555 and only needs to hold up 387, so it's good, right? Now, what I want to do is place these stiffeners as far apart as possible because I don't want to keep placing these. So let me go to View, Freeze Panes so that I can scroll over a little bit and hold that. Okay, so watch what happens when I take this, um, this, see this panel dimension of 60? Watch what happens when I make it larger, 65. The capacity gets smaller, right? I'm taking those stiffeners and I'm placing them farther and farther apart. The farther apart I place them, I get to a point where it gets weaker, right? So 65 works. What about 70? 70 works. 75, 80, 85, 90, ooh, 90 doesn't work, right? Too far. So 85 works, was it 86 works, 87 works, 88, ooh, 88 doesn't work, right? So that first panel, I ought to place that at 87 inches. So go into this, remember I said here's the answer. There's the answer. That first stiffener is 87 inches. Sound good? Not too bad, right? Now let's keep going. So now we have sort of a final answer. So our first answer is from 0 to 87, there's a panel. Let's unfreeze that so I can see what's going on. Sound good? Now let's go to panel number 2. So same dimensions, but, but look at this. The dimensions have to start from x equals 87 to the next value. You see what I mean? So see how the x coordinates sort of, you know, progress? So I have to go anywhere from 87 to 207. Let's go with a panel width of, I don't know, 100. Sounds good, right? All right. Same story. Compute a K. Compute the limits. D over TW. Is it elastic? Here's the possible values. There's C. Sound good? Same story. Now, we are dealing with an interior panel, so now we can use tension field action. So is it the full action, or is it just the, uh, the, the tension field alone? So if you look, you know, we either have full tension field action or reduced tension field action. You know, this is the plus that beam behavior. This is just the tension field by itself. How do we determine what's going on? Well, it's based off that limit. 2D times TW over the area of the flanges. So when I compute that limit, it comes out to be 2.173, so we're allowed to use the full field. So if we're allowed to use the full field, okay, Here's the plastic capacity of the web and shear. Here's the panel aspect ratio, D naught over D. Here's the full capacity and here's the reduced capacity. I'm calculating both of them. And since we've got full, that's our capacity we're using now. Sound good? Now, there's the capacity. There's how much it can hold up. Are we good? We're good, right? Now, the farther apart I space that panel, the better. In fact, I could go all the way to, what is it, 110, 120. I could use 120 and that'll take me all the way to 207. And I believe it still works, right? But I propose an advantageous location is actually to use, well, hold on. 201. Actually, yeah. Let me let me do. I I could use the 207, and that would work. Yeah, sorry. I could use the 207, and that would work. But I propose an advantageous solution is to use 201. The reason why is because I'm gonna have to put a plate there anyways for the cross frame. Why not double up? Why put two plates there? Why not just use that cross frame plate as a stiffener? Because you can do that. So, does that work? Yeah, it works. 
go through, get the same answer. Now, you can go through and continue the iterative process. My maximum value that I'm allowed to use is 207. If I go ahead and try the maximum value, I find that, lo and behold, it does in fact work. And if I go through and look at my next one, was that next cross frame is at 576. I believe I end up using, was it 81? Because that puts me at 576. Make sense? So here's my actual results of my design, okay? I have a stiffener at 87 inches, and then another one 201, another one 207, and technically there's a stiffener right about here. It's 81 inches apart that, or 81 uh, inches from that, that also doubles as a cross frame connection plate, but we didn't really need it there. Does that make sense? That's an important concept to go through, so I want to see if, if anybody has any questions. Anybody have any questions? It's not too bad, right? I, I posted the sheet so you all can have that. Sound good? All right. All right. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is the actual stiffeners themselves. Um, the stiffeners have got to be they've got to be bulky enough to resist all those the, those shear forces within a given panel. But they're they're pretty rote from a design standpoint. Okay. Now. The one thing that we've got to take a little bit of time and discuss is concentrated forces, particularly on bearing stiffeners. You know, the bearing stiffeners are the ones that go directly to the abutment, and they got a big support reaction on them, so they see a lot of compression. So we've got to ensure that they uh, are adequate to resist those loads. Uh, usually, bearing stiffeners are a lot larger than your uh, shear stiffeners. Okay. Now, we have three different types of stiffeners that we deal with in, in bridges. We have transverse stiffeners, bearing stiffeners, and longitudinal stiffeners. What do I mean by that? This. So there's a, a, like a pier. Okay? The bearing stiffener is the one that's right there at the pier. Okay? Now, the code dictates that at the pier or at an abutment, you have to have a stiffener on both sides. For shear stiffeners, transverse stiffeners uh, within the girder, you, can only, you only need to put a stiffener on one side. Like, if you notice, I've got the stiffener behind the web, and I've only got one of them, okay? Now, a longitudinal stiffener is one that runs along the length of the web. Don't do that. If you can avoid it, don't do that. That's just a lot of welding, a lot of time, a lot of money that you could probably avoid if you just made that web maybe a sixteenth of an inch thicker or a little bit shallower. Sound good? All right. Again, stiffener can be on either side. We can have a one-sided stiffener or a two-sided stiffener. When possible, use a one-sided stiffener. Okay? Usually a lot of times if you look at uh, highway bridges, driving down the road you won't see the stiffeners, but if you pulled over on the side of the road and crawled up and looked, all the stiffeners would be placed on the inside. For some reason I guess people don't like seeing stiffeners, so they place the stiffeners on the inside so the public doesn't see them. I, I don't get it. But. I think they're fine, but that's me. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So this is what I was saying earlier. Transverse stiffeners can be on either one side or both sides. Bearing stiffeners, the ones that are at the abutments or at the piers, you got to have one on both. Okay. It's just you got to have that. Okay. Now bearing stiffeners got a little bit more going on because they have to look at that. They have to determine or, or be strong enough to resist not only that the, the shear in that end panel, but they got to look at, or they got to be able to resist that reaction, that compressive force. Okay, so we got a number of requirements we got to meet. So first off, um, projecting width. In other words, the ratio of the width of that stiffener to how thick it is. And we have a pretty plug and chug limit that we have to meet. And that's for, intended to ensure that the stiffener doesn't locally buckle. Pretty straightforward. Now bearing resistance, we have a plate coming into contact with another plate. So there's stress right there at that connection that we have to resist. And that bearing resistance I propose is computed as the yield stress times 1.4 times the area. And the area is 
the area of contact. So what I mean by that is that width times that thickness times two, because one, two, right? Now, why does that width not equal that? Why do we cut that little notch right there? We call that a clip. Why do we clip that? Well, there's going to be a little weld right here and a little weld right here. We can't, can't be, come into contact flush. We've got to clip that plate a little bit. So if you see a stiffener, it's a big rectangular plate with a little clip like that. Well, keep scissors there. Acetylene or something like that. Sound good? All right. <coughs> now, we have to look at the axial capacity of that stiffener as well. Remember, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's experiencing that big support reaction. Now, I propose that we're essentially looking at a column. It's a very short column. You know, it's just that stiffener and that little bit of the web, but it's a column, okay? Now, the way that we do this uh, is as follows. We treat a stiffener and a little portion of the web as what we call a cruciform column. And a cruciform column is a column that has a cross-shaped cross-section, like a look, looks like a plus sign, okay? So, you know, like an I-beam cross-section, a cruciform cross-section looks like a plus shape. And cruciform columns are really weird because when they buckle, they don't buckle, you know, out or, you know, out like this. When you load them, they buckle by twisting. They, they, they undergo a twisting failure. They're a little strange in the mechanics world, so. Engineering 670. <laughs> All right. <coughs> now. Based on the uh, behavior, we uh, define that cruciform column as the stiffener and then a portion of the web. Particularly, uh, we, we extend the web out on either side. We say, let's extend it out nine times the thickness. That's about how much of that web is effective uh, for that column. Now, when you look at columns, we need section properties. We need moments of inertia. We need an area. The area of that column is going to be two times the width of that uh, stiffener times the thickness of that stiffener plus 9TW squared. And why am I getting 9TW squared? Well, the area of one of these rectangles is 9TW times TW. And then there's two of them, one here and one here, and there's two of these, one here and one here. Now, the moment of inertia, we're looking at the moment of inertia about this axis. So, you know, you know BT cubed over 12. This really doesn't generate much moment of inertia at all, so we just say, what the heck, let's just let that equal zero, and the radius of gyration is I over A. Sound good? All right. <laughs> now, when you're looking at a column, we need an effective length. Remember, KL. Um, for this, we're going to say KL is about 75% of the depth. Close enough for government work. Once you've got radius of gyration and an effective length, you've got a slenderness, and we go to that. May that look familiar? It should from steel design. That's your column strength equations, right? It's written a little differently, but in the end, this is the same stuff you did in undergrad steel. All you need is a KL and an R, and that's it. Pretty straightforward, right? Sound good? Now, Q is the only thing that's a little new, this term right here. It's a slender element factor if you've got slender elements that are going to locally buckle, but we're trying to prevent local buckling, so we take that to be 1. Our phi value for columns is 0.9, and that's all there is to it. Any questions? All right. So let's size a bearing stiffener. So we're sizing a bearing stiffener right here at the support. So we need that you know, maximum reaction at 387.8 kips. Okay? Now, we're going to make some assumptions right off the bat. When we size bearing stiffeners, we, we typically make them from bar stock. So bar stock is sort of like strips of steel that come in like 4-inch widths, 6-inch widths, 7-inch widths, things like that. And we'll just sort of cut off how much we need. So the last thing you want is to be specifying a stiffener that's 7.826 inches wide. Just go with 8, go with 6, go with something common. So we're trying even uh, plate width. Okay. Now we want those plate widths to fit somewhere, you know, in here. So, you know, this width is 8 inches, so coming in off that uh, web thickness, 
probably a little over seven inches right here. So we say, what the heck, let's just assume that the width of that, uh, that stiffener is seven inches. Pretty reasonable assumption, right? Make sense? Now, here's the width. We need to solve for the thickness. I'm going to solve for the thickness by using our projecting width requirements, rearranging and solving for T sub P. So what am I doing? You know, taking this and this, dividing it over, and I get T sub P has to be greater than or equal to all of that. Plug and chug, and it comes out to be about 0.6. So we'll say, what the heck, let's go with 5 eighths. So we'll say we got a bearing stiffener that's 7 inches wide, 5 eighths inches thick. Sound good? Now, <coughs> That's just, we're not done. We have to check all the other requirements. Now, we have to check bearing requirements. So we'll assume that we have a clip on that. Um, remember that little section that we cut off the stiffener? We'll assume that clip is an inch and a half uh, wide. So we've got to determine the area. So the area is two because we've got two bearing stiffeners. We have the width minus that clip times the thickness. So it comes out to about 6.8 square inches. Our nominal capacity is 1.4 times the area times the yield stress. Yield stress, we'll say, is 50 KSI. Area, what we just calculated. Phi RN, since phi is 1, comes out to 480-some kips. That's less than the shear that's on it, so we're good. So that thing in the blue box, that's a performance ratio, right? Remember how we take the uh, load over the capacity, and if that number is bigger than 1, uh, we got problems. So that's good. Questions? For the axial capacity, we need some properties. We need the area, again, very plug and chug. We need the uh, moment of inertia, again, very plug and chug. We need the radius of gyration, very plug and chug. KL is 0.75 times the web depth, which comes out to about 51.75 inches. And Q is automatically 1 for these calcs. So we calculate our Euler buckling load, pi squared EA over uh, the slenderness squared. Calculate our squash load, Q times FY times the area. And then it goes back to the old, B, our old column equations that you did back in undergrad steel. Or, or if you took advanced steel here, you probably saw these as well. Inelastic buckling, elastic buckling. Um, this ratio is going to dictate, I believe, inelastic buckling. Let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, way, uh, way inelastic. So here's our capacity. Plug and chug, and you'll get a capacity of, uh, what is that, 586.5, way larger than our factored shear, so we're good. So that bearing stiffener is adequate, a 7 by 5 eighths. Yes, sir? Well, okay, that's a good question. We're, we're not really deciding. What I would say is this. The bearing stiffener is always the one that's at the abutment. The transverse stiffeners are everywhere else. Okay? So what I mean by that is this. Let me skip ahead a little bit further. Whoop. All right. So here's our design. I propose that that is a bearing stiffener because it's at the abutment. That's got to be 7 by 5 eighths. We haven't done the others yet, but we'll get to those here in a second. Make sense? Excuse me. Did that answer your question? Is everybody else all right with that? Okay. <laughs> now, transverse stiffeners, um, they don't see those bearing effects, but they got to be strong enough to resist all that shear buckling. So we end up having two requirements we've got to meet. Those transverse stiffeners have to have enough projecting width, you know, they have to be wide enough, and they also have to have enough stiffness, so that means they need to have a certain moment of inertia. Okay? Now, projecting width requirements, we, this is uh, just to ensure that they're wide enough to resist your compression flange. So there's two of them, and you really just take the governing one. The uh, uh, width of that stiffener has to be greater than or equal to 2 plus D over 30, and that, uh, that ratio also has to be in between 16 times the uh, uh, thickness and the width of the uh, flange over four. Uh, again, pretty, pretty plug and chug and pretty straightforward approach. Now, the actual um, moment of inertia requirements for a stiffener come from stuff that was, or the basic ones, come from stuff that was derived uh, back in the 50s. It's just trying to ensure that they have enough stiffness 
to resist the buckling of the web. So it's, you know, your moment of inertia is just BT cubed times an adjustment factor, and as long as it's bigger than the limit, th then we're good. The, the problem is we do have to tweak this a little bit when we're dealing with uh, uh, two things. Number one, this classical solution deals with elastic buckling. So because we have the potential for inelastic capacity, we have to use an upper bound. Again, I know the equations are nasty, but it's plug and chug stuff. Critical buckling stress, a ratio of yield stresses, and another uh, limit. The only other uh, l tweak that we have to consider is tension field action. A lot of these classical solutions didn't consider the fact that the web could hold up load well past buckling. So this is a following limit that's suggested in the spec. It's basically linear interpolation. Pretty straightforward stuff. Don't worry, we'll, we'll exercise this. <coughs> All right. Let's design uh, transverse stiffeners for our, uh, for our girder. Okay. Um, let me go forward. Okay. All right. Let's design transverse stiffeners for our, for our girder. Now, um, remember some of those uh, uh, rules of thumb for girder sizing we did last week, you know, how wide and thick plates should be and whatnot. Stiffeners, by and large, just based on plate availability and a little bit of common sense on the fab shop side, really shouldn't be thinner than a half inch. Okay. So we're going to just take a stiffener thickness to be a half inch. Now, our projecting width requirements tell us that we have to have a, a, a projecting width or a width of that stiffener somewhere between 4.3 and 8 inches. How am I coming up with that? Well, the projecting width has to be greater than or equal to 2 plus D over 30. 2 plus D over 30 in this case is 4.3, and it's got to be somewhere between 16 times the thickness, which is 8 inches, and the flange, uh, uh, the compression flange width over 4, which is 4 inches. So aggregating all this, it's got to be somewhere between 4.3 uh, and 8. Sound good? <coughs> all right. It's iterative, so we go back to using Excel. So let me sort of explain what's going on uh, on the Excel. So here's our design, and this is our final answer. Right? What I've done is this, okay? <clears throat> These are all panels, and really what we're concerned about is the line between the panels, because that's where the stiffener is. So if you look at the transverse stiffener layout, I want to sh show you how it's working out. So see how I've got panel one, panel two, panel three, and panel four? These dimensions came from what I sized on the previous page, all right? Now this is panel one, this is panel two, so you know, like if I look right here, you know, panel one and panel two, what I care about is that. I want to look at that stiffener. So I care about that, that line in between. Sound good? Now, let me delete all these. Okay, so <coughs> here's our uh, stiffener thickness, you know, we went with half inch. We know it's got to be somewhere between 4.3 and 8, right? So let's just say what the heck, let's just assume 5. So based on that, I can compute a moment of inertia and I can compute a aspect ratio or that panel width. My limiting moments of inertia, again, very plug and chug, pretty straightforward. I'm computing each of these values using the expressions that you see up here. Here's the effective width of that panel. There's J, that adjustment constant for our moment of inertia. There's our critical buckling stress for the, uh, for the stiffener, our, reinforce, or our ratio of our yield stresses, and that upper bound. Now, we're going to need a number of relevant shear forces. We need V sub U, which is the maximum shear that that panel is seeing. We're going to need the critical buckling stress, which is just, um, <coughs> excuse me, which comes from over here. We got that from the previous page, you know, C and then V critical. 
And we also need our shear capacity, which we calculated you know, in the previous section. Now, here's the deal. We calculated our moment of inertia of the panel over here. We have the following limit. So, if we have a panel that doesn't require tension field action like the end panel, this must be bigger than the minimum of our two floors. If we do require tension field action, which is in those interior you know, panels, remember we can't use tension field action at the end, but in the interior we're more than welcome to, we've got that linear fit in just linear interpolation. So if I go with a five inch stiffener, I find it's not good enough. I gotta make that stiffener wider. So I say, well maybe I'll make it six inches wide. Eh, not good. How about seven? That did it. So that first stiffener, we got to bump that up a little bit. It's got to be seven and a half inches. This one and this one, however, because the shear forces are lower, I can get by with using uh, a smaller stiffener. In other words, it's got to be between 4.3 and 8. Let's just do 5. Go through and compute everything we find those are good. That's it. That is shear design in a nutshell. So you use all those rules of thumb to size your flanges and your webs. You do your moment capacity check to see if they're good. Next step, start laying out your stiffeners for shear. And it's funny how your girder is starting to come to life. Any questions? All right. Now next time what we're going to do which I guess next time is, I'm not going to do anything, you all are going to do something. But after that, we're going to talk, we've got three more big topics I want to talk about. One of them is the studs. You know, how do we lay out those shear studs? Because that's kind of important. The next one is how do we actually do our deck casting analysis? And finally, fatigue. We got those three in the bag. It's funny how you all know how to design a bridge. That's all I got. I look forward to your presentations next week. I will leave you to it. I know I threw a bunch of equations at you, but hey, you made it through it, and now you can look to see Clinton has 44 electoral votes and Trump has 51 electoral votes. But Florida is... They're 59% are reporting and they're going for Clinton. We're looking at, you know, 3.972 million votes for Hillary, 3.968 for Trump. So that's 59.38% precincts reporting. Real quick, let me see something. Jim Justice is currently leading West Virginia. So. All right. I'm done, at least for the bridge engineering folks. Y'all have a good evening. We'll see you next week. I look forward to your presentations.